Good evening and happy Thursday and welcome back to another episode of Mid-American Gardener. I'm your host and Master Gardener intern, Tanisha Shades Fain. This week we're going to answer lots of great questions. We've also got a ton of show and tells we're going to show you and all of that will be brought to you by our expert panelists. So let's get started. We're going to have each of them introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about their specialty and we'll jump right in. So Marty, we'll start with you. Hi, my name is Marty Alanya. I'm a landscaper. Um, shall I go right to my show and tell? Well, let's let's introduce everybody, and then we're going to come back to you. All righty, because All right. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> Go Hi, for it. My name is Doug Barkley, and uh, in addition to running Barkley Farms Nurseries, I'm the horticulture instructor down at Lakeland College, and uh, my specialty, I guess, would be in perennials and grasses and plants. Wonderful. Hi, my name is Kelly Alsup, and I am an extension educator in horticulture for University of Illinois. And I love answering questions about insects when Phil Nixon is not here. <laughs> but if Phil Nixon is here, I'm um, really good at houseplants and um, annuals and perennials. Wonderful. All right. So as promised, we've got some show and tells to get to. And Marty, uh, we're going to start with you. But she goes, she just can't wait to I can't. show you what she brought in today. So I can't. What are we talking about? Well, we're talking about plant labels because nobody ever, ever, ever reads them, you know? <laughs> okay, there's like these little Bob Cratchits that work for these seed companies, plant companies, and they're, they're wasting away with their little pencil nubs and they're trying to be succinct enough to fit on a tiny square and you never read them. And I know you don't because then you go, I didn't think this was gonna get that big. <laughs> really? Okay. <laughs> I had to draw a label. I don't know if you can see that or not. Um, when you look at the label, lavender, and then single quotes, always single quotes, not double. It'll have the name of the kind of lavender because there's lots of different kinds. This one's called Hidcoat. And the real name, the Latin name of the plant will be Lavandula angustifolia. It's kind of, kind of, uh, it's kind of Dracula-like, isn't it? Okay, <laughs> then it'll give you the light requirement and the water requirement. They like full sun, they like dry soil, they're a Mediterranean plant. They like gravel better than soil, really. It's a little too rich around Illinois. If you plant them right by the driveway, awesome. Bloom time, summer, but also lavender will also rebloom throughout the year, particularly if you shear it after it first blooms. Height, 15 to 18 inches. I had weight here because I wasn't paying attention to what I was doing, but actually it's width. <laughs> 12 to 18 inches. Some plants get taller than they are wide. Some plants get wider than they are tall. If you have a short plant, if you read the labels, people, you'll know what it's supposed to do. And then you won't put the short guy in the back. You also won't put the big thorny thing 18 inches from the sidewalk. And then you try to shear it and it looks terrible because <laughs> it's too close to the sidewalk <laughs> and you hate it. So either you have to move it or it goes to compost camp and then you replace it with something that's not too large for that space. Read the label. You can learn so much off of here. What's the last one I got? Oh yeah, the hardiness zone. That's really important. I thought this was gonna overwinter. No, no. If you read the label, it'll tell you. Five, yeah. Seven, no, it's not. So please, pull the little tag out, educate yourself. It's so much easier. I tell people this all the time. And here I am on TV. Read the label. <laughs> you know, she's always going to give it to you straight from the hip, people. Yeah. So <laughs> that's the only way she knows how to do I it. I was going to talk about a, an idea I had for a show for PBS, and it's a, a gardening theme, except the characters are fruits and vegetables. I wanted to call it Fruits of Passion. It was going to be kind of an <laughs> insecticidal soap opera, but I really haven't gotten it all together yet. So <laughs> It's still in development? It is. It okay. Is. I'll, we'll I'll look for that, you know. maybe. We'll see okay. what happens. <laughs> All right, Zach, you've got to show right. it out. Yeah, i got to follow. Okay, um, <laughs> what I ended up bringing today was this ornamental grass. And just, you know, ornamental grasses are, are, grasses are a passion of mine. Um, and just a couple of things. This particular grass I brought is uh, a type of miscanthus. Um, it's actually one of the older ones, miscanthus sinensis gracilimus, mm -hmm. or a maidenhair grass, not, not a fancy name. Mm -hmm. um, but a couple of things about grasses, very, very low maintenance. You mow them down once a year. You do that in the spring. You do not do that in the fall. Mm -hmm. uh, they're just kicking in. Some types have already started blooming. Others, like mine, are just opening up. Uh, they're in this very pinky purple stage, and they're going to turn much brown. Uh, this particular one, the blooms are about this high, a little taller than normal this year, about as tall as I am. Uh, but um, 
I know some people got frustrated with grasses because we had that strange spring. If everybody can remember back to all the roses and, and a lot, some grasses and some other plants being killed back. Sometimes you need to go back to the older style, meaning this maiden hair, I've had it in my yard for 28 years. So go back and, and I know sometimes in the garden center, people walk by it because it's the old plain green one, so to speak. <laughs> but sometimes there's something to be said for having the ones that are really yeah. true and steadfast. Yep. Meaning the cold's not going to bother this. This thing will go, you know, a whole state north of us. Um, zero insects, zero maintenance. It's kind of a carefree plant. Oh, yeah. um, uh, again, the only maintenance is you do cut it down once a year. But but again, this is a maidenhair. Uh, two of the most reliable I've had is Grisomus, or the other one is uh, Sarabandi. Um, uh, very similar to each other. But uh, uh, So if you had a grass and you got frustrated, froze out, try, there are some that are definitely more tougher than others. Check the zone on the label. Yeah, one of the things you got to be careful of, I will, now I'm going to back up and say, whoa, stop, uh, because grasses don't work like other plants. Um, mm -mm. I, I deal with some growers out on the East Coast and, and they get confused. So there's some grasses they have out there listed as zone five. I can't grow and I can grow some zone six. So Midwest, grasses are one you got to be careful. And my answer on, on that is, is talk to somebody. I had so much trouble, we actually started making our own tags because of the hardiness on grasses can get really confusing. Yeah. We don't, in, in this particular where I'm from, we don't have a lot of snow cover. Gotcha. Yeah. And that, that really can mess with some grasses. It can. So is it that where that 5B comes into play? Does yeah. it really kind of fine tune? But it they does. try. It does. Try. And, and yeah. I, I don't know, hardiness zone has changed and the plants haven't. So, so in some cases, ah. champagne here is now in zone six but that doesn't mean I can grow plants that I couldn't 10 years ago. So we have to be careful with that. Yeah. Gotcha. And uh, you know, if on a south facing wall, it makes a big difference between that and being on the north edge of a, of a field right. for five miles in the bitter winter wind. Mm -hmm. Microclimates are really important. But well, and if, if, if everybody remembers back to the cold this year, it wasn't that we got 25 below zero. No. It's we went up and down so mm -hmm. quick yep. that knocked things out. And harding the zone yep. only partially that takes it. that into consideration. So a, a 60, 70 degree swing was more what the problem was than, gotcha. than it was 25 below zero. Yeah. Gotcha. That's true. Okay. All right. All right. Kelly, do you have a... Show and tell I as well? do. Right. I have one of my favorite plants to grow, and this is blood flower. And that is, I grow this because I want to feed my monarch caterpillars. And um, it's what is awesome about this, like I said, annual milkweed. So it's blood flower. You're going to find this at some of your higher end uh, nurseries or greenhouses uh, in the spring. Um, you can also, once it starts to form the normal milkweed seed pods, take seeds and plant it again in the next spring. But look at this. I will plant this uh, blood flower next to a butterfly weed or a swamp milkweed, mm -hmm. and this one will be continuously blooming, and I brought in my butterfly weed to compare. <laughs> and not saying don't grow butterfly weed, because butterfly weed is amazing. But this one is still blooming, mm -hmm. still providing nectar for butterflies and bees. And um, this one has already gone to seed and died back. Um, another plant that we showed um, on the um, screen was a tahonia, a Mexican sunflower. And it mm -hmm. had, uh, it's the best picture I've ever taken in my life. It had a beautiful <laughs> monarch butterfly. It and that's a another it one a <laughs> that you can take. Mm -hmm. Once those seed heads dry up, you can go ahead and grab them and save them for next year. Now, you, you, grabbing the seed heads, you don't have a tag for this one, but this <laughs> one gets pretty tall and yeah. it needs to go in the back. So yes. it goes by the tahonia, goes behind the blood flower. Exactly. And um, then you'll have your, uh, your plants for your butterflies and your caterpillars. And this one is super fun to grow. Um, I actually, when I compare the native versus the blood flower, this one always has a lot more monarch caterpillars on it. Interesting. Than the natives. And those two colors together. Oh, wonderful. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. With the Mexican sunflowers behind it. That's, yeah, that's beautiful. Um, they're just really great plants to have. And we had a great year for monarchs. Um, anybody that grew, mm -hmm. uh, but grew milkweed this year, probably got their plants totally stripped down. And these have actually been stripped down and are re-flushing out new growth. 
Awesome. Okay, we've got one call to take. Oh, a couple calls it looks like. Paula in Champaign is online too. She has a question about leaf loss on bush. Paula, are you there? Yes, I am. All right, go ahead. Uh, we live in Champaign. Uh, we're at a northwest corner of the intersection nearest our house. And all but one of our bushes made it well through last year's winter. Uh, mm -hmm. The one that didn't, we think we bought long ago, uh, and it was a pygmy red barberry. Well, the plant just, it, it's between five and six feet tall now. It's bushed out beautifully. But come warmer weather, the only leaves it produced were on kind of the northeast and southwest sides of the bush. So there's, you know, it's got half the leaves it used to have, but the ones that aren't there, I don't know if it's because a wind blew through or what, because otherwise the bush looks perfectly healthy. So they were on there in the spring and then they fell off this summer? No, they didn't come back in the spring. No, oh, only, there, only the there opposite corners of it. Okay, that part died. of the plant has died. Yeah. You just might as well re, re, right. remove the dead part, and then also, you might also want to reduce the, the general size of the shrub. Not necessarily, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe two-thirds of it. Almost a rejuvenation, but not, you know, down to six inches high. Um, they usually come back pretty well. Um, I don't know. If, you, if, she's, if she's talking about over half the plant dead, though, I don't know if that would come back. Well, if you cut out the dead, I mean, it, yeah, it depends on how much, you know, how how large a percentage the live parts are <laughs> right, <laughs> right. compared In to the dead to, parts. Yes, yeah, yeah. So you might, I mean, if there's just corners and you think that the new growth or the greener part can fill in where you take the dead, but you I definitely have to remove the dead plant material, and then try try cutting it back, reducing it, and. Yeah, the, those you know, particular branches, if they're dead, are not, if they haven't leafed out all back. year, they're not going to. So anything mm -hmm. that doesn't have any green on it. But it, unfortunately, that's one of the things about plants is they don't necessarily go from black and white, alive and dead. You've got one that had several parts yeah. of it not make it, not make it through the winter. Yeah. And barberry would be, be particularly because probably the drought of the fall before would have helped it not make, or cause the problem not making mm -hmm. through the winter. But Mulch would be a good idea. A little extra water this fall, maybe. Okay. I think Better you're going to have to decide how much of it's alive and if cutting it back would flush it out yeah. <coughs> or if you need to send it again. to compost camp. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All, right. <laughs> All right, Marty, we're going to come back around to you. Uh, okay. You've got another show and tell for I us. I do. We have more labels. <laughs> okay, these are all soil <laughs> amendments. All right. I have sulfur and I have cotton seed meal. And I have bone meal. I have these fabulous pictures on the front. Those those are just what you put them on, okay? That's not what the stuff looks like. All right. Again, the labels. The labels will tell you what is in here, okay? Phosphorus, nitrogen, and potash. That's what those three numbers stand for. Phosphorus helps the flowers grow. Phosphorus, flowers. An F sound, it's the first thing you think of. Ooh, I want to grow those flowers, okay? The second number. The second number is the thing, second thing you think of, but it's the first thing you see. Nitrogen. Nitrogen grows green. That's why when you put, um, when you feed your lawn, <laughs> the feed doesn't have any potash or phosphorus in it. You don't want that. You just want nitrogen. And the last one, it's the last thing you think about. It's potash. It feeds the roots. Okay. So these all have different kinds of applications and the labels will tell you how to do them. Some you work into the soil, some you can work into the soil, or you can use them as a top dressing. But it tells you all this on here. I constantly have people asking me these things. And I hate to say this, and I, I do like to get paid for my knowledge, but just read the bag. <laughs> It'll tell you exactly what you need to know. It's no problem at all. Just read it on there. You know, It will tell you what it does. It'll tell you how often to apply it. It will. It's just all the information that you need is on here. Just read it, please. Just she's help begging me out you here. people. Okay. She's <laughs> begging you me. to read the it's labels. It's killing me. <laughs> all right, and then you'll get flowers that look like this. Yay! Ta -da. Okay. And also, these are all organic, by the way. Soil sulfur, cotton seed meal, bone meal. And people can find these. Anywhere. If they want this specific brand, they oh, can. Oh yes. Okay. Yeah, high yield is is very common. It's okay. all over the place, but there are other 
um, companies that make these also. Um, and just, you know, they, they all help a little something or other. And depending on what you need, ask your, you know, ask your garden center help and see what they can see what they can aim you toward there's there's some that are chemical there are some that are organic you know just whatever suits your fancy but um, it's it's very simple to amend soil you just have to do it and some of them are longer acting some of them are quicker you know now let me ask you so. this is that something you should do if there's a problem if there's no problem you know if you've got something that is blooming well and performing well do you add soil amendments, or or is that something you do if you see? Not usually. Yeah, okay. it, it has to it has to look like it's struggling. Got it. To me, really, um, here in the Midwest, we are blessed with amazing soil. We are. pH is just a little bit on the high side, maybe, but and still, it's not difficult to to drop the pH just a little bit. So you can work in sulfur or cottonseed meal, peat moss, even. Mm -hmm. Also, when you do long acting amendments, things that you put in the soil that have to break down. You can also um, get uh, liquid fertilizer mm -hmm. and give that plant a, a water-soluble jolt of something um, lower pH and kind of get it on the road yep. to not being so chlorotic yellow when you see the leaves turn yellow and you see the veins are nice and green but the rest of the leaf is like <laughs> so this will help this will, you do, do the long acting and the short acting as well okay all right I've actually oh. added soil sulfur to my garden this year because we had a soil test ah. that said that we ha our pH was way too high, and so oh. the soil testing company recommended that I add four pounds of sulfur every fall go. for the next four years. And so, yeah, I love the, you know, but I always tell people to take do that soil test first. Absolutely, because it is amazing what <laughs> kind of information you can get from a soil test. And oh yes some mistakes that you might have been making the whole time. Especially if you've tried to grow something in a particular spot, mm -hmm. and especially if you've tried a couple different things mm -hmm. and they just keep on croaking, there's something going on there. Yeah, yeah. You know, a little you tweak. Test the soil and see what happens. And you can also buy soil test kits. It's fun, it's easy. <laughs> okay. From Ronco. You know. All right, Thank <laughs> you've got easy. another show and tell? Yeah, I just brought another little plant from my yard. I didn't know how many people are familiar with this little purple guy. Uh, Brazilian verbena, verbena bonariensis. Um, it's, it's technically, I guess, a zone six plant, so a very mild winter. If you head south, it might make it very protected. But mostly it freezes out, but uh, it's an annual I think is worth it just because it's so unique in its flower power. It's another one of those that's great for butterflies. Um, this is, I mean, I picked this today, so here it's still blooming this late and mm -hmm. loves all the heat. Um, it is a little bit of a tall and gangly plant, so um, if you like a really reformed garden, but it has a very wild look to it. It will self-seed, um, but a couple of things about the seed, if you're not, the seed is very, very tiny. You may want to collect it. It's, it's about half the size of a sand. Um, and a couple of things about that wow. seed, the seed needs light to germinate. So for me, it's always strange because I can't get it to reseed in the flower bed. It comes up in the gravel. It'll because actually is not affect the, the <laughs> pH. It'll yeah. come right up in limestone. Yeah. Um, so sometimes I may have to start it and plant some starts in my flower bed because again, I'm one of those that likes to mulch heavy, and this seed has to have. And even if you start it yourself inside, mm -hmm. you need to sprinkle it on top um, because if you plant it like you do your other seeds down in the soil, uh, this just isn't going to come up. But again, very tiny. Most people have a tendency to overseed it, but. Uh, low maintenance, mm -hmm. good for attracting butterflies, long, long on blooming, you know, five, six months. Nice. Yeah. Late, late pollinator feeder. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I have a friend who loves that and she grows it every year and she has to go pluck them out of the cracks in the sidewalk and the yes. driveway. Oh, wow. yeah. They start to come, I'm like, come here little fella, you're going to move over here. Because <laughs> yeah. they, yeah. yeah, any place hot and warm wow. and yeah, they sunny. Love the heat, love oh, the yeah. yeah. Interesting. Right out. Okay. Kelly. Do you want to talk about I am going to talk pumpkins about or insects? You choose. Insect ID. Okay, next. let's do it. Um, and uh, Marion um, from Monticello, mm -hmm. Illinois, um, wanted to uh, talk about some insects that he found on his um, butterfly weed, which is the milkweed that I showed earlier, and. Um, and the benefits of butterfly weed. We know that milkweed really is a great plant for numerous insects. 
And uh, I even have a book that I have in my, in my office called Monarch, Milkweed, and More. And it shows all these different types of insects. And the reason is, is because milkweed has that white sap and it makes these insects unpalatable, which is a great thing to be unpalatable <laughs> if you're an insect. <laughs> so this particular insect that he is talking about is a milkweed bug. There's also a milkweed beetle and they like to congregate together because what they're doing is they're injecting an enzyme into the plant and it's breaking it down faster. So they all are together, that way it's easier to feed. If they were to be on different parts of the plant, then they'd all wouldn't have the benefits of the mm -hmm. enzyme the that they are injecting. <laughs> so teams. it can Go be teams. a little disheartening to look at your beautiful milkweed and see all these milkweed bugs or milkweed beetles, or even we had tons of aphids this year, but, um, you know, there's no, they're not, they're not, they're not wonderful, but they're not harmful. And uh, when with the aphids, there's always something eating those aphids because <laughs> they poop sugar. <laughs> you and, learned something today. And when oh, yeah. you when you poop sugar, you have a lot of things that are willing to eat you, and then because you don't taste bad. Take a <laughs> no. <laughs> Oh, it's like usually like, you know, with some of our beneficial insects, the adults will eat the sugar poop yeah. and the larva will eat the aphids. So the circle um, of life. So oh, yeah. <laughs> I, lots of gardeners Drums. are yeah. nervous about other bugs on milkweeds. Oh, I want to make sure my milkweed is pristine for the monarchs. Eh, let them, let them have it. Let them have it. Let All them right. have it and just enjoy the diversity of insects. Okay, we're gonna to go to Dan in Effingham with a question about weed killer for grass. Dan, are you there? Yes, I Go am. right ahead. Hey, I was in my uh, garden center the other day and I found some stuff made by Roundup and you spray it on your yard to kill like crabgrass, buckhorn and all those type things, you know? Mm -hmm. But on the label, there says nothing about how heavy to put it on. Have any of you had any experience with it, how heavy to put it on? That's my one question. Next question is by spraying it this time of year and killing it, what, are we wasting our time? Because normally the frost in the fall gets them anyway, you know. And also, will it come back next year if you spray it and kill it this fall? Most of them have gone to seed or process of seeding, so mm -hmm. you, and they're, you're, you're mostly routed off annuals, but. Yeah. Yeah, if it's a project product that contains glyphosate and that's what you're talking about, <laughs> Is that what he said? Do not, you, no, because no, it won't not, kill the grass. So it's got to be a mixture of both a 2,4-D dicamba, and it's got to have oh, yeah. that so other stuff that kills it. So it's got to be a mixture grass. of about three things in there. Yeah, it's mostly, yeah, he's a broadleaves in crabgrass, but it wouldn't kill the long grass. But yeah, most of the things you're, you're trying to kill now are annuals, and like Dyke said, they've already gone to seed, so the damage is done. You might as well wait until spring to spray. Um, and a lot of times the label will peel off and fold out because yeah. it will tell you on there. It, it has to by law, but it the other thing you can to, do if yeah. that label was removed by somebody else possibly yeah. is look it up online. You should yeah, be able to look that idea. specific product and get the rate. Yeah. For idea. us to not know the brand and rattle off rates, I don't, yeah. there's no way we could do that. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, I'm gonna try to get one more call in. Jeff in Normal has an unknown fungus on gardenias. Jeff, are you there? Mm -hmm. Oh, we love gardenias. Yes, um, first of all, I love your show. It's great for us self gardeners. Thanks for um, watching. I have, uh, I bought a gardenia, it was the last one I could find. And, uh, cause I love the smell. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, when I bought it, it had some blooms, but they quickly rotted and fell off. And I mm -hmm. had been given by, <coughs> excuse me, the nursery some some uh, spray called eight instead of seven. And it says it kills fungus and bugs and everything. So I sprayed that on it before I brought it in. And um, now the leaves are getting yellow. That might, I understand, be just a, by virtue of the sunlight. But um, it looks like a, a white powdery um, fungus or something, and I don't know if I would hope that I could uh, use something to save the plant. Um, and then generally, do you have any um, just general tips on bringing potted plants inside for the winter? And um, thank you for your information. Yeah, well, if it's mm -hmm. a fungus and it's all over the leaves, it's probably powdery mildew. 
mm-hmm. which uh, there's you know some great products out there. It kind of it makes me say Millie Bug before powdery mildew, just because yeah, that's what is usually on those types of things. Yeah, um, so I would just look up Millie Bugs, look up powdery mildew, and then you know go to your garden center and ask about those. And then just general for uh, house plants is, you know, don't pot them up. Know they're going dormant and you can wash them off with water before yep. you bring yeah. them in yep. and that'll get down. rid of yes. some of those insects. Mm-hmm. Okay. The other yeah. thing with gardenia oh, is it's a finicky plant. So it, to me, it <coughs> is, anytime you move it, you'll get some yellow leaves. Now you're talking disease, but me. the bloom's falling off and some yellow leaves, you'll get that every time you move a gardenia. Mm-hmm. They don't like to be moved. They also like very, very bright. It says bright indirect light, but anything you have in the house is probably suitable because it's not bright enough for them. So the brightest window you can put them in on the dry side, feed, they're heavy feeders. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for watching tonight. Thank you so much for your calls and questions. Make sure you check out our podcast wherever you podcast, and we will see you same time, same place next week. Good night.